All right, people, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell notification. That way you'll know when I upload the next video and you'll be supporting my channel. Follow me on Twitter. Every time I upload a new video, I'll be tweeting. Origin gents, on Musa Jurex, and this is 40k Lord, the Death Corp of Krieg by the channel Arch. Uh, yes, uh, we're resuming fourth part, I guess, of the Death Corp of Krieg. I love this so far. Uh, you know, the story has been so interesting that, you know, the, the wealth basically got into their head, at least uh, the people who are in power, I guess, the people who are rich try to you know get away from the imperium like why the fuck would we stay with imperium they don't even care about us they probably don't even know we exist or something because there's such a big empire so try to get away with it there was a war a nuclear winter 500 five centuries of war and then in the end everybody just got super depressed about uh, they went against the emperor felt guilty and now trying to make up uh, about what they did by basically being suicidal and you know people made some correction in the comments that i you know i was hoping that this would be the case apparently it is they're not just point blank suicidal they are one of the most effective uh, soldiers that are they just don't care about living basically they are fine if they if it ends up dying and they are uh, they are so glad to do suicidal things if it's effective not just for the sake of dying but if it's really effective and it's suicidal they're fine with it so they're really suicidal in that way, effective way. That makes them really, really dangerous. So, you know, they're, they're trying to make up for all, every, everything, all the wars and shit, and, you know, trying to please the emperor. So they are in this way. And we, uh, you know, so, so far we've been learning that how their culture is molding, apparently, that, uh, you know, human lives are not as that important in their culture. Like, soldiers get weapon. Uh, that doesn't necessarily reflect like how should we preserve the soldier no how the soldier is effective if the soldier dies he dies like this grenadier here i love how this grenadier thing right so, uh, of every uh, different faction and different type of uh, warhammer you know uh, groups that i've seen not many but still to me grenadier just is just perfect if if there is one figurine I, I would have i would have the grenadier figurine because i don't know something about this is really fucking capturing like you know their equipment and everything is not to so they would survive is this so, so they would be effective and they are heavy weapon people that's why they have backpack and everything and uh, the way they fight sometimes it can be hand to hand combat and their the way the, their weapon works might not be perfect for that but nobody gives a fuck right because when the situation right that weapon really works like killing a massive horde of orcs and things like that so it's awesome all right let's watch it it really is considered a privilege and an honor granted they don't have the right to refuse the honor either but an honor still is an honor and as for privilege well it doesn't have much in the way of privileges it is not a promotion, you retain the same rank as you did in the regular Death Corps, but, well, you get a fancy helmet. Which is gonna end up getting you killed, granted, but hey, details, and if you should be so incredibly fucking lucky as to actually survive, that makes you eligible for Watchmaster training. And Watchmaster is the first official rank one must achieve on the long and extraordinarily thorny road towards that fancy-ass officer's helmet. And he's de facto a non-commissioned officer, the rough equivalent of a sergeant in other Imperial Guard regiments. As you probably gathered by now, when a Death Corps regiment is, is raised, all of its officers, including its NCOs, are brought in from other formations that have, in all due likelihood, been wiped the fuck out. Or, if by some utter goddamn miracle, have actually had too many officers, which considering the casualty rates, is pretty rare. Nevertheless, any Death Corps formation would not be complete without its NCOs, as these are the men responsible both for training the raw recruits and instilling in them the proper sense of responsibility that the battlefield requires. After all, they've had it easy up until now. 
The Watchmasters also double as squad leaders. In your average Death Court of Krieg regiments, you would have 82 Watchmasters, one for each individual infantry and or heavy weapon squad, one per platoon command squad, one veteran Watchmaster per company command squad, and finally, the role of Watchmaster for the regimental commander is taken by the regiment's commissar. Furthermore, each Watchmaster has himself a personal little butt boy, a teacher's pet if you wish. This is his senior guardsman aide. This is essentially the, the second aide. in command, whether it be in the squad, in the platoon, or in the company command squad. He is also a person that the Watchmaster is essentially grooming for the role of Watchmaster. Uh. Naturally, he still has to survive his period in the Grenadiers, but considering he's been under the personal tutelage of a Watchmaster, somebody who already made it through their Grenadier service, his chances of surviving are probably 3 in 10, rather than 2 in 10. Oh, now, that's just too much. that our hopeful little <laughs> cadet has not only survived his grenadier service, but also made it through his period as a watchmaster, he will reach the first commissioned officer rank of the Death Corps of Krieg, which interestingly enough is not a direct command position at all. Or, well, it is, kind of, but not in the way you might expect. What? The quartermaster is an interesting amalgamation of battlefield medic, administratum clerk, and ecclesiarchy preacher. He is supposed to wander the battlefield during and after a battle and retrieve casualties. Although, well, to be fair, retrieving casualties is his secondary duty. His primary duty, as hinted at by the name quartermaster, is to get their equipment back. Mm. After all, replacement personnel are a dime a dozen. Krieg spits those out by the millions every single year, but las guns, power packs, bayonets, chainsaws, rebreathers, boots, uniforms. No. These things can be damn hard to get a hold of. No. Seriously, every time some uh, soldier from Krieg comes and visits, they've been told, watch out for equipment, they're much more worth than you are. Oh, God. Imagine that. Walking into a battlefield and knowing that your gun is way more valuable than you are. That is some next level shit. Especially since all of those millions coming out of Krieg also require all of these things before they leave the planet. Now, of course, the Quartermaster isn't entirely heartless. He will aid soldiers that are wounded. With certain qualifications, shall we say. The role has its origin during the brutal civil war, when resources were extraordinarily scarce, and in fact the most expendable resource for both sides was manpower. This meant that neither of the warring sides really wasted much in the way of resources on men that wouldn't fight again, and it was the quartermaster's task to determine who deserved medical attention, because they could be returned to the fight within a relatively reasonable time frame, and who had earned the Emperor's mercy. Which is of course a term used to describe a battlefield execution. Oh. These days, the quartermasters are a little bit more merciful. N not in that way, I mean as in actually saving them, because they have access to considerably larger resources and considerably more technology with it's, you know, every time somebody becomes some kind of a medical field, of, uh, doctor, anything, right, paramedics, they, they take certain oaths for this particular fucking reason. Like, you can, you know, pick and choose like that on the field, like, who deserves to survive or not, something like that. So this is so dark, basically just walk around, hmm, he could be survived, but the resources is too much. Eh, fuck you, just die and just walks away. That's just so dark, man. But then again, Warhammer 40k, of course, is dark. With which to return troops to the front line. But even then, it is the quartermaster's job to put the needs of the regiment ahead of those of any single individual wounded soldier. This means that if the quartermaster deems that the same amount of resources that would be spent on one severely wounded man could potentially save two others, he will not hesitate a single instant to put a las ball through the first man's head, pausing just long enough to deliver him the Emperor's benediction to make sure that his soul flies straight and true to the Emperor's side. 
Which, to be fair, it might. The Emperor is, at this point, pretty much a Chaos God. It's not entirely impossible that he's got himself a little part of the warp somewhere with these poor, pitiful... Come on, man. He's saying, like, it's a fucking fact by now that Emperor is a Chaos God. A uh, Chaos God. Isn't that, like, you know, just a theory people use, but there's no guarantee of that? I don't know. And since Emperor is fighting against Chaos, I mean... He, he might be a god-like being, but saying he's a chaos region god feels weird. Because if he was chaos god, wouldn't he be stop fighting the chaos? Souls can rest. The alternative, well, let's not dwell too much on that, shall we? It'll make an already rather depressing episode even worse. And as for the command aspect, as mentioned, the Quartermaster is a commissioned officer, which means that he is officially commissioned to lead men into battle, unlike the Watchmaster who is a non-commissioned officer. However, the Quartermaster, as mentioned, do not lead soldiers. Instead, they usually surround themselves with a gaggle of medical personnel and servitors. Since, of course, Quartermasters are few and far between, and after a nice big battle of marching slowly into machine gun fire, there is more than enough for a Quartermaster to do. So much that he needs to delegate at least a little bit. <laughs> well, I just realized that every time, you know, the, fall the Fallout players, which I'm among them, right? Every time you, you can easily spot who's a Fallout player, right? Fallout Elder Scrolls player. The guy who basically is, you know, basically f try to find every single square inch of the place and try to find even a single coin. So basically a hoarder of some sort. So a guy like that would be so perfect for a quartermaster, let's be honest, because, hmm, go oh, goody, the, you know, open battlefield, many dead. What should I do? What should I scavenge? Assuming that the person in question survives the quartermaster role as well, which by the way, is probably the safest of the ones so far, then he will finally become a proper officer, with a proper command and everything, and the usual rank structure will now reassert itself. There are, of course, another couple specialized roles within the Death Corps, however, beyond the usual guardsmen, these being a Death Corps engineer and a Death Corps rider. The riders are not so much a specialized branch as they are a pseudo-elite within the Death Corps. They are cavalry that specialize in direct assault. Yep, that's right. Whilst most cavalry in 40k perform a harassing role, essentially meaning that they're motorized infantry without the motor part, that they will descend from their horses and fight on foot, the Death Riders, they utilize their hunting lances in the way they were always meant to do, in straight-up massed cavalry charges. Now, this would be suicidal for pretty much... In Warhammer 40k, cavalry charge, come on, doesn't feel... I mean, with all that one's weapon and basic, you know, equipments, vehicles and God knows what, cavalry charge, doesn't that feel like a bit weird? I don't know. Any Rough Rider regiment, but the Death Riders are equipped with the Krieg Steeds. This is a very, very heavily genetically modified version of the original Terran horse. Although at this point it's probably got more in common with a fucking grizzly bear than it does a horse. These things have been known to take several heavy bolter rounds to the chest, essentially pulping virtually all of its internal organs and still keep going for another couple hundred meters. Despite all of this, the casualty rates amongst the Death Riders are actually relatively small when compared to the infantry. Of course, when they are actually in direct combat, they die like absolute fucking flies, at a rate that even the infantry would shake their heads at. But for the most part, they are deployed as light screening troops, as scouts, and as a rapid breakthrough force. They are not, generally speaking, hurled against entrenchment and bunker complexes. Due to this somewhat unusual nature, the members of the Death Rite I don't know, some form of adventure bikes, is that too much to ask for? Armored adventure bikes with massive suspense and jumping around the places. I don't know, this is Warhammer Advanced Age, why horses? ...are usually selected for two traits that in the infantry would be considered highly unfitting indeed, and that is independent thought and initiative. Both of which are considered dirty, filthy curse words in the infantry. But due to their role as advanced scouts, breakthrough troops, and screening troops, the Death Riders have to be able to make independent decisions without waiting for their higher commanders to give them instructions. 
But this self-reliance is not entirely unique within the Death Corps, although relatively rare. There is one further branch of the Death Corps military that also needs to have the ability to make decisions on the fly, and that is the second and last specialization, Death Corps Engineers. If the officers are the brain, the Death Corps riders its eyes and ears, and the infantry its lifeblood, then the Death Corps engineers are the strong hands of the army. They are the ones that dig the fortifications. They are the ones that prepare the positions for artillery. They are the ones that dig the offensive saps, allowing the Makes infantry sense. to get closer to the enemy's position without having to wander unprotected through no man's land. And all of that is, of course, before we get to their true main military purpose, that of digging massive fucking tunnels underneath the enemy's lines. Either for offensive purposes, e.g. burrowing into the enemy's trenches and then unloading thousands upon thousands of guardsmen, or by depositing vast quantities of explosives and making sure that the enemy lines simply cease to exist. Unfortunately, the enemy is very rarely particularly fond of this eventuality. I love how, you know, certain games, at least, has this kind of a thing where there is always a heavy gunner, there's a soldier, there's certain type of, uh, you know, people, and there's also some sentinel engineer type of people who uses different equipments and just, you know, all around just, you know, building and equipments to, you know, be effective and in certain situations they are way too effective, way too deadly. This kind of feels like that. Okay, which one was that? I forgot the Team Fortress, right? Yeah, Team Fortress has also that that uh, engineer guy who can do turrets and things. At certain conditions, they could be really deadly. This is this feels like that. Their job is to build shit, you know, make shit happen, and you know, at certain times, they could be really deadly. And will do everything in their power to stop the engineers from completing their mission. This leads to a peculiar and extraordinarily nasty form of warfare, partially because the two sides are essentially blind. Even the most high-tech 41st millennium technology can only do so much to identify an enemy that is sitting behind literal tons and tons and tons of earth. Yeah. This means that every single swing of a pickaxe, every single move of a shovel, could potentially collapse in on an enemy mine, which leads to a very quick, very vicious, brutal close quarters encounter, where the two sides will be fighting each other in a literal trench, perhaps a couple meters wide and a couple meters tall at most, and frequently considerably less than that. And once an enemy mine has been broken into, all bets are off. The Death Corps engineers are given a huge quantity of specialized equipment to fulfill their variety of roles. Bolt cutters, auspexes, shotguns, long saw Ooh, blade bayonets, folding spades, melter charges, mole launchers, frag grenades, crack grenades, carapace armor, specialized gas mask, etc, etc, etc. But perhaps one of their nastiest weapon are their might... gas hand grenades. Mm. These pump out a particularly vicious form of gas that is capable of even eating through gas masks if they are exposed to the gas for long enough periods of time. Now, of course, the Death Corps engineers are fully aware of this, and yet they will not hesitate a single second in deploying these weapons. Any and all actions taken underground are bound to be short, vicious, and extraordinarily bloody for all parts involved. And perhaps the worst thing is that it is far easier to collapse a mine than it is to build it. Which means that when a mine is discovered, the enemy is sitting on all the cards as to how to deal with it. And even if the Death Corps engineers are capable of breaking into the enemy mine quickly enough and decisively enough to stop them from collapsing it, you can bet your happy little ass that they will definitely be collapsing the exit. This can, in most cases, lead to the Death Corps engineers losing days, weeks, possibly even months or years worth of work in mere minutes. It can be an extraordinarily trying form of warfare. Not only are you under constant stress due to the fact that at any moment all hell can break loose, you also have to deal with the fact that rather frequently all of your hard work is going to be for absolutely nothing. Yeah. It's the kind of warfare that is quite likely to break a man, but... Look, I'm a, I'm a basically a builder, you know, contractor, you know, for factories and things. 
I know how that feels, right? I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, the accident does happen, right? Sometimes, you know, basically, a, you know, RCC slab basically falls down for some incompetence here and there. That's not your fault. But, you know, after putting lots of money, resource, and a few days into some complicated shit, if it falls down, you're like, what the fuck? I have to do it again. So I can kind of feel that. But, <laughs> but this closest thing I can think of to this guy is basically Julius Caesar. He was like, the, he, he, used, he need to think about the combat tactics and try to be Bob the Builder by building shit, building bridges and God knows what. Fortunately, the men of Krieg have seen worse and will continue to see worse for as long as they are serving within the Death Corps. If anything, this really is the form of warfare that suits their demeanor the absolute best. And finally, of course, we come to the humble Krieg Guardsman. Yep, I uh, will take the next time. I, I wanted to finish this, but you know, I'm, I really don't have time. It's just 10 minutes left, but uh, still, I'll do that tomorrow, I guess. I really have to go. But yeah, so far, this has been awesome. Uh, you know, every single, the, the horse thing, I don't get that. What the, why the fuck horse? I mean, any, any equipment, I mean, you could make some kind of bike, quad bike, some vehicles, God knows anything. The engineer is awesome, I like that uh, bit of element. I feel like you know, of all the Imperial Guards, this is way too complex than that, that Death Corps of Krieg with the different, uh, you know, different type of uh, people that are. So this is overall just awesome. All right, people, uh, you know, especially the Quartermaster, right? What if Quartermaster dies, right? He has all this job, but what if he's the one who gets shot by a long distance cannon or something? Who the fuck knows? Uh, what happens then? But yeah. All right, people, if you like my video, don't forget to like, subscribe. Check out my Twitter account, you know. Uh, but this video probably won't have any notifications sent out because I already uploaded three videos today. So, you know, it's already hard for people to know when I upload the new video or something. So check out the Twitter account. I'll be constantly tweeting every time I upload a new reaction video. So if you see one reaction video that you want to watch, you could basically click on it and know it when I upload. Because otherwise, lots of time people just say, oh, look at that, you did this reaction months ago. I didn't even know it because, you know. Yeah, YouTube just, I don't know why YouTube just sends three notifications. I don't know, six, seven, why just three? I don't know. Uh, I mean, you know, but now reaction channels are a real thing. Even YouTube is acknowledging that. Every time if there is an issue and you appeal something, there's literally the first list that, you know, what is, is this a reaction video or whatever? Reaction videos are so big now. I don't know, you, I guess they have to, you know, uh, cater to that. Because lots of reaction video channels, you know, channels basically upload multiple videos a day. So I don't know. All right. I'll see you next time.